Scripture reading for the lesson today will come from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. <clears throat> Unto me, who am less than least in all of the saints, is grace, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. In teaching anything at any level, a certain basic understanding of fundamental facts is necessary. Wouldn't you agree? Even in kindergarten. There's some things you just have to learn in kindergarten in order to get out of kindergarten, right? Well, think about that with regard to the Bible. There are some rock bottom basic fundamental principles on which our convictions either stand or fall. And we've talked about three thus far, haven't we? We talked about the inspiration of the Bible. We talked about making a distinction between the covenants, and we talked last week about Jesus of Nazareth. Now, there, those are just some very simple, very basic things that we have to speak the same thing about. Today, we're going to tackle another basic that really is a basic, and that is the church. Now, when you hear the word church, what comes to your mind? A building? Surely not, is it? And you know, most of us who were exposed to church were exposed to such at a young age by our parents or by someone we love. So our, our first experience with the concept or idea of church was molded in our youth. Now that could be a good thing if you were taught correctly, but that could be something that's very difficult to overcome. So we're going to try today to talk about the church and to try and give the truth about the church. Does the New Testament even mention anything about the church? Well, we'll see if it does. But in the mind of some people, it doesn't really matter. And I don't know if you've ever really stopped and tried to do an internet search on various churches throughout the world. Let me give you three here that I found kind of odd or strange. The first one that, that just strikes me as odd is the Church of Satan. <laughs> You do understand that there are varying degrees of that, but there are people who identify themselves with something that is called the Church of Satan. Now, I don't see how anybody has picked up the Bible and come up with that conclusion. So when you have no standard or faulty standards, you're going to get a faulty conclusion. Another one that kind of struck me as odd. There is a group of people, I couldn't find their name, but they practice something called holy laughter. And they just assemble together at a place like this and they just start laughing. And they laugh out into the pews and stand up and laugh and lay down and laugh and just, just carry on. And I, I would suppose that when they de determine to leave, everybody feels good about themselves, right? I don't know that that happens here, but anyway. The one that really caught my mind is just odd. Everybody in here familiar with Star Wars? Who hadn't heard of Star Wars, right? Did you know that there's a religion called Jediism? You can go out and do whatever they do and you can practice whatever it means to be a Jedi. Isn't that, and I don't mean it wrong, but isn't that ridiculous? Isn't that ridiculous? That shows that when there is no solid foundation, there's no telling what people will do. There is no telling at all. Did you pay attention to the scripture reading? Because there's something very important in that that we all need to know in Ephesians 3, 8 through 12. Paul says unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which 
from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now pay attention to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. I strongly suggest that in that text you underline, you mark, you highlight, whatever it is you do, three words, church, eternal, and purpose. That proves that Jediism, Satan worship, holy laughter, all that stuff, that was not in the mind of God from eternity, but the New Testament church was. Today we're going to talk about the basics, and we're going to talk about the Lord's church. Four things today. Number one, we're going to talk about the concept of church. Is church in the New Testament? What does church mean, and does it really even matter? Yes. Number two, we're going to do a brief count. We're going to count how many churches are authorized by the New Testament, and how many churches did Jesus actually build? Number three, we're going to talk about the components of the church. Is church membership even important? Can I join the church of my choice? Can I go be a Jedi with God's approval? And then number four, very briefly, we're going to try and comprehend this lesson. Can I know that I am a member of the Lord's church? And if so, how? Now that's what we intend to do, so let's begin. Let's talk first about the concept of church. Is church in the New Testament? What, what does church mean and does it really even matter? Well, yes. The exact English word church is used in the King James Version of the New Testament in 76 different verses. That settles it. And really when you look at the Greek word that's often translated as church, it's in the New Testament in at least 115 different verses. Now, how many times would a word or a doctrine or a concept need to be in the Bible before we say, you know, that may be important? You know, maybe, maybe we should pause and reflect on what this word church that we keep seeing in the New Testament. Seventy-six times, there it is. Should we reflect on it? Try to figure out what it means? Well, yes. So it is true that the concept of church is a biblical subject. And since that is true, it is of eternal importance that we all understand exactly what the new teaches about church. Now, the simple meaning of church is the called out. Did you catch that? When you define the word church, it means the called out, as in called out ones or called out people. You will struggle in vain to search the New Testament and find where the word church means building. You will search in vain to go through the New Testament and find a scripture that teaches that church means building. Now, don't we talk like that? Don't we talk like, now, we don't mean assembly, and we'll talk about that. We talk about going to church, meaning we're coming to the building. Now, where does the New Testament teach that? Now, if you mean, and we'll see, that church can mean assembly, then that's fine. But by and large, when you leave your home, your residence to come here, you're coming to the church building for what it's worth. Now, the word church can also mean assembly. And in Acts 19.32, Acts 19.39, and Acts 19.41, the word that is generally translated as church is also translated there as assembly. So that helps us give another idea behind the word. It means the called out, but it also has reference to the assembly, these people assembling themselves together at a certain place. But did you know that in the New King James Version, in Acts 7.38, they rendered the Greek word as congregation. Now, every which way you look, in reputable versions of the Bible, the Greek word generally translated as church not one time means a building. It always has reference to people. I want you to turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 18. 
And I want to show you what I believe to be one of the clearest examples that church never means building. And if so, then you explain what Jesus says here. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 15. But we're really going to pay attention to verse 17 quickly. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 15, Jesus says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Verse 16. But if he will not hear thee, now look, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Now look at verse 17 carefully. Look, there's an order here. But look at what verse 17 says. And if he shall neglect to hear them, now look, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, tell it unto the church. Now do you think for one second that Jesus had any reference in his mind to walking into this building and standing and looking at these four walls and saying, you know, I've been wronged by my brother. I just needed to get that off my chest. Well, look at the rest of the verse. But if he neglect to hear, is that what Jesus says? He says, go tell it unto the church. And if he neglect to hear the church, now I can tell you, I spend a fair amount of time in this building, in and around this area. I've heard a lot of things. I've heard a lot of little sounds. I've heard the phone ring. I've heard all kinds of things like that. But I have never heard this building speak audibly to me. What's my point? Church never means building. It always refers to the called out. It always refers to people. If he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Let me give you a little bit more detailed definition of the word church by piling some scriptures up here for you. Church is the people who have obeyed the first principles of the gospel call. Let me put some scripture on it. Romans 10:17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Well, how do you hear the word of God? It's in the gospel, and you're called by the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2.14 Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what are some of those first principles? Let me give you one that's very simple and very basic. Mark 16.16 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And once that has happened, we have thereby been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And once we've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light, we have been placed into the kingdom. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And you know what else the church does? We abide in the doctrine of Christ, 2 John 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. And let me give you one more thing about the church. Being a member of the church includes worshiping according to the divine New Testament pattern. John 4, 23 and 24. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now there's a long and detailed definition of the called out. You're called out from the world of sin by the gospel into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. Now let's do a quick count. Number two. How many churches are authorized by the New Testament? How many churches did Jesus build? I'm telling you that Jesus built and authorized one. Put a scripture on it. Matthew 16. And let's look at verse 18 beginning. Actually, let's back up to verse 16. And let's read down here and try and understand what's going on. Jesus built and established and paid for one church. 
Matthew 16 and verse 16, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. Who, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. That simply means Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. How did the Father reveal this unto Peter? By giving evidence. The evidence was totally clear. You didn't get this from all these other human things. You saw the evidence and you came up with a correct conclusion. Now look at what Jesus says in verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock. Some will say, see there, Jesus built the church on Peter. You're wrong. Jesus did not build the church on Peter. He built the church and the church is established on the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. If that's not true, nobody built anything of any worth. And upon this rock, Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, I, Jesus, will build my. That means possessive, doesn't it? If you talk about something that's mine, being yours, that means you possess it, right? My, what does he say? He does not say my church is plural. What does the Lord say? The Lord says my church singular. And the gates of hell, that is Hades or death, shall not prevail against it. Now look at verse 19. And I, Jesus, will give unto thee, Peter, the keys of the kingdom. Now who started this? Jesus started this. Jesus said I'm going to build my church and then give Peter the keys to the kingdom. Does that mean that Peter's standing there at the pearly gates of heaven letting you in or out? Come on now. We know he used these keys in Acts 2. That's indicative of authority. You're going to be given authority to open the kingdom. Did he do that? Well, we know he did. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Simply, that's apostolic inspiration. When he spoke in Acts 2, as did the other apostles, they spoke infallibly. Now, listen to me carefully. Universally, I can prove, now in a universal sense, I can prove only one church. Now that, that sounds like a difficult doctrine to some people. But I would say by and large in here, are you familiar with John 14, 6? Do you realize how exclusive that is? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, by and large, people in the south, the, the south southern part of the United States, they have no problem with hearing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Who, doesn't everybody believe that in here? Now, that's not true necessarily worldwide or maybe even outside of the southern half of the United States. But when you hear Jesus make a statement like that, do you realize how exclusive that really is? So I can prove only one Savior, just as you can. But you know what else I can only do? I can only prove one authorized gospel. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another. But there be some that would trouble you and pervert, warp, twist, change the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received let him be accursed. How many, how many saviors can I prove? I can prove one. How many gospels can I prove? I can prove one. So therefore, it should not be that difficult a doctrine to see. I can prove only one church. And by the time you read Acts 2.47, the promise that Jesus made in Matthew 16.18 was fulfilled somewhere between there and Acts 2.47. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But preacher, you know... You ain't as smart as you think you are. Well, I know that. Because I read the New Testament and I find the word churches. Oh, you got me now, don't you? No. Universally, there is only one authorized church. But locally, 
There is the one church in various locations. And there's the explanation of the word churches in the New Testament. That would not simply mean congregations or assemblies of these people in various different geographical locations. Even a casual reader of the New Testament, you won't have to read too far before you read across the word church is, as in more than one. So how can Jesus build only one church and there be church is in the scriptures? I told you. These same people have obeyed the same form or pattern of doctrine everywhere. And when they do that, they've been added by the Lord to the universal church. And the universal church can meet in various locations. Think with me about Romans 16, 16. Salute one another with an holy kiss. Now that doesn't bind the kiss now. You understand that was a custom. What is bound is a holy greeting. The church is of Christ salute you. So what did Paul mean in just that one scripture? By churches of Christ. These same called out people who've obeyed the same gospel in various geographical locations really all over the world. And then you read the book of Revelation. John is told to write unto the seven churches, plural, of Asia. Well, how do you explain that? There was a congregation here. There was a congregation there. There was a congregation in those seven different cities in Asia Minor, technically. The one gospel had been obeyed and practiced in various places. Therefore, you have church is. One gospel, one savior, one church. But when those people obey them in different places, they are the church is, as in the assemblies or the various locations of the one church in different geographical locations. Now, number three. Let's talk about components. Is church membership important? Can I join the church of my choice? If nothing else, Matthew 16, 18 proves that false. But let's, let's flesh it out a little bit more. Church membership is important, or Jesus built a useless organization, didn't he? Why would Jesus use the phrase, my church? If the simple aspect of any church is as good as another church or I can go join the church of my choice, why would Jesus say and promise to build my as in his church, singular? Now, I want you to turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 15. We can all do whatever we want to do. You want to go join a church, you, you have, I suppose, the right to do that. But that doesn't mean God approves of you doing that. Look at Matthew 15 beginning in verse 12. That may hurt somebody's feelings. You know, Jesus hurt a lot of people's feelings. It may hurt your feelings to hear that all churches are not the same. If so, then the Jedi church is just as good as anyone else. Then the church of Satan is just as good as one else. Now, they don't nobody believe that. They'll say one church is as good as another, but they don't believe that, do they? Now, look at Matthew 15 and verse 12. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Oh, knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended? After they heard this saying, so Jesus immediately went and said, Oh, I beg pardon. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I didn't know this was going to hurt your feelings. Is that, is that what happened? Look at verse 13. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. What did Jesus say? Now, isn't that what we expect sometimes of religious people? You hurt my feelings in the name of religion. You better apologize to me. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Don't you leave this building and think that one church is just as good as another. Jesus didn't teach that. Jesus didn't teach that. Now, we are added to the church universally. Find the phrase, join the church of your choice in the Bible, for example. You won't find it. But I can show that we are added by the Lord to the church. And we are added universally to the one true universal church. There is no voting process. There is no popularity contest. You don't have to go about with signs trying to politic your way to become a member of the Lord's church. It's very simple. In Acts 2, beginning in verse 36, 
Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked to their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now watch verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. What were they baptized for? They were baptized for the remission of sins. And the same day, now watch, look at the wording of the Bible. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Well, where were they added? Verse 47 tells us. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, watch. I'm going to make a, a quick argument. In verse 41, the baptized were added. Do you see it? The baptized were added. Do you see it? Now look at verse 47. The saved were added. Do you see it? So the baptized are the saved. Do you see it? Those who have obeyed Acts 2.38 are the saved. Where does God put all the saved? The, the God of heaven puts all the saved into the church. Well, church membership is unimportant. The Bible doesn't teach that. If the Bible teaches that church membership is unimportant, let me tell you what that's equivalent to saying. Look, look. I can be saved without being saved. Do you understand? That's, that's ridiculous. Why? Because the church is the saved. So if you can be saved and not be a member of the church, then you can be saved and not be saved. That's ridiculous. That's impossible. Think of it this way. I can be saved outside of the saved. Wait a minute. The Bible teaches that the church is the saved. The Lord adds the saved to the church. Church membership doesn't matter. Well, then you can be saved outside of the saved. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. That is absolutely not true. Now listen with these components. We are added universally, and I'm preaching to the members here now, but we identify locally were added by the Lord to the universal church, the one true universal church, but we identify locally, that is, with one congregation. For various reasons, some people don't like to identify with a local congregation. I don't understand why. Perhaps it could be that people say, well, I'm a member of the universal church. It, it doesn't matter where I worship. Where does the Bible teach that? Where does the scripture teach that? I don't see that it does. Some may say, you know what, it'd just be a stumbling block. I, I, like, I like to wander around. I want to wander around and float from congregation to congregation. Well, where does the Bible teach that? I'm going to tell you what I believe it to be. I think it is some people just simply don't know. Some people just simply don't know that you need to, I, even if you were added by the Lord to the church in California and you're here in North Carolina, you need to identify with a local congregation. Let me tell you why. The New Testament teaches that the elders are to feed the flock, feed their flock. Now, how can the elders feed the sheep that they don't even know if they're their sheep or not their sheep or if they're going to be here or if they're not going to be here? Can we use this man? Can, do you understand? So I'm glad that some of you in here were added by the Lord to the universal one true church. But you need to identify you need to make it known. I like it here. We want to worship here. You don't come talk to me. Stand up, Frankie Klein. There's one man right there that you can stand up. There's one that you can go talk to. John Harper, stand up. There's another one that you can go talk to. Gary Harper, stand up. There's another one that you can go talk to. And Mark McClannan, stand up. There are the four men, if you want to identify with this local congregation, thank you, that you can go talk to. You can talk to me anytime about anything, but I'm not an elder. I'm not one of your shepherds. Those men shepherd this local congregation. There is who you need to talk to. Now, I've grown my mouth a lot, haven't I? And it's about time for me to put some scripture on it. Fine. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. 
Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Go back and look in Acts 20 and verse 17 and see to whom Paul is speaking. He is speaking to the elders of Ephesus. Do you see what he told them? Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you, the elders, overseers. Who oversees the local congregation? Yes, Christ is the head of the church and the savior of the body, but who oversees the flock? It's not the preacher. It's the elders. Now how? Here's the question. How can the elders feed the flock when they don't know who's their flock and who isn't? There is a personal responsibility that we all have to the elders. Turn me to 1 Thessalonians 5. Now I prove that the elders are to oversee the flock, the local congregation. We're added universally, but we have to identify locally so that we can be shepherded by those who oversee the flock. Then I'm going to prove it. If Acts 20 and verse 28 didn't, this does. And it shows that we have a personal responsibility to the elders. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 12. And we beseech you. I'm beseeching you, brethren. I'm glad that you obeyed the gospel in California. I am. But you need to identify locally. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. And look at the word. And are... What does the Bible say? Over you. Well, who's over you? The ones who are over you are the overseers. Who does the Bible say are the overseers of the local congregation? The elders. Acts 20 and verse 17 and Acts 20 and verse 28. And admonish you. Now look at it again. We beseech you, brethren, to know them. That means we have a personal responsibility to get to know the eldership. Personally. And labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them, verse 13, very highly in love for their work's sake. And be at peace among yourselves. I think some people don't identify locally because they simply don't know. Now you know. Now number four. Very quickly. Let's try to comprehend this. Can I know if I'm a member of the Lord's church? If so, how? Yes. We can know whether or not the Lord has added us to his one true church or whether he hadn't. Now, how do you explain that, Brock? Brock how do I know if I've been added by the Lord to the church? It's, it's very simple and it involves two things, honesty and integrity. Let me put it to you like this. If you just figured out today that baptism is for the remission of sins, and, and that's what the Bible says in Acts 2.38, and you were baptized, not today, it's very questionable whether or not the Lord added you to his church or not. Let me, let me express it a little differently. No one can be taught man-made denominational doctrine. Do you understand what I'm saying? You cannot be taught man-made denominational doctrine and obey that man-made denominational doctrine and somehow poof. I've just become a member of the Lord's one true church. Well, how did you do that? Because what you were taught isn't in the Bible and what you obeyed isn't in the Bible and yet you somehow become a member of the church that's found in the Bible. Honesty and integrity. If you can't put your finger on the scripture and be honest about it, you ain't going to make it anyway. If you can't put your finger on the scripture with what you did, you need to be honest. You need to have integrity because your soul is hanging in the balance. The church is the saved. If the Lord has not added you to his church, listen to me, you ain't right. You're not right. You need to let the Lord add you to his church more than once. It's been claimed that the truth was obeyed in denominationalism. It's not possible. How do I know that? 1 Timothy 
But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Watch what he says. The pillar and ground of the truth. You will not get the whole truth of God in denominationalism. If you obeyed a part of the Bible in a denomination, you're all the way lost. Now, I don't know how much plainer I can state that, short of calling names. Think with me. Has the Lord added you to his one true church? Does it matter? Oh, yes, it matters. What can I do to have the Lord add me to his church? Hear the truth. Romans 10, 17. Believe the truth. Acts 16, 31. Repent of sin. Acts 17, 30. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Acts 8, 37. Be immersed in water. And the purpose, the purpose is vital for the remission of sins. For the Lord to add you to his body, the called out, the saved. Brethren, when we've done that, it's our duty to walk in the light as the Godhead is in the light. 1 John 1, 9. Come now. As together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.